Hello listeners! Welcome to the first program in our series, Let's Learn Fashion and Fabrics, which is produced for JS Grade 9 learners and anybody else who has an interest in the subject. My name is Jeanre, and today we will learn about the importance of suitable selection of clothes for a teenager. Please have a pen and a notebook ready so that you can make notes on the important points. And don't forget to take part in the quiz at the end of the program. Clothes play a very important role in our lives. Therefore, it is very important to select clothes that are suitable for different age groups. At the end of this program, you should be able to define the following terms. A fashion silhouette, classic style, identify different garment pieces, necklines, arm finishes, list the factors influencing fashion. Wow, did you see Miss Janana today? She's really wearing a nice dress. She looks fashionable. She knows how to dress, hey? Maybe it's because she's a fashion teacher. Yes, the dress is nice, but I don't think it's appropriate for her age group. For people that don't know much about fashion, I don't think they'll be happy seeing her wearing that type of dress. They'll think the dress is more appropriate for teenagers. It's time for fashion lessons. Let's rush to class. You know, Miss Shinana doesn't like it when you're late. Good morning, class. Good, Good morning, morning, Miss. Can we all take our respective seats? Cecilia and Vern, do I always need to remind you each and every day that a student has to be punctual at all times? I'm sorry, Miss. It won't happen again. Sorry, Miss. We lost track of time discussing your dress. It's really nice. Well, thank you, guys. You just took us to our lesson for today. We will be discussing the importance of suitable selection of clothes for a teenager. So what do you think about selecting clothes for teenagers? What comes to mind? Tavern, your hand is up. Do you want to share something with us? The type of fashion, for example, is it fashion fed or a classic style? Uh, Divan, before you continue, what is classic style? Okay, Cecilia, let me help there. There are two terms that you need to know. They are fashion silhouette and classic style. Fashion silhouette is the outline of something, the shape of your body, specifically created by different clothing styles worn in different periods. Classic style is a style that lasts for several seasons sometimes even years, and it is accepted by a wide range of people. For example, denim. Well explained, miss. So when selecting clothes, you should be able to know whether the style is fashion fed or classic style. I know we learned the definition of fashion fed in grade eight, but I'm sure some students forgot the definition. Maybe Cecilia should refresh us on fashion fed. Absolutely. Fashion fed is a short-lived fashion only accepted by a certain age group, appearing suddenly and disappearing equally fast. Basically, fashion fed is more for teenagers. Thank you, Cecilia. The other most important fact that you need to keep in mind when choosing your garment is the neckline. What type of necklines do you know? I know the V-neck. And the v-neck is suitable for women with medium chest and not for women with large and small chests. Very good, Devon. There are a number of factors that determine the success of a garment. Without a doubt, its neckline is one of the most important. Most of us do not choose the neckline of a garment in isolation. We look at the style, the fabric, the color, etc. And then the neckline. But we forget that the neckline of the bodice frames your face and accentuates its features and is the first thing others see, mostly when they look at you. The choice of the neckline is dependent on many factors, like the shape of the face, 
shoulders, size of the bust, the bust line, the neck type, and above all, the body shape of the wearer. Just as the way we consider all the above mentioned factors when choosing a neckline, a neckline in turn makes all these features look good, like the face, shoulders, bust line, and the whole body shape. Let's learn the common types of necklines. A jewel neckline. This is a slightly lower round neckline and it's the most common seen in dresses and tops. This is called a jewel neckline because the neckline lies where a necklace is worn, suggested for women with smaller chests. Two, a V neckline. It is an almost perfect neckline that will look good on most everybody, as far as I've seen, but for apple body shape, it is a lifesaver. This neckline can elongate the body and it is the choice neckline for people who are short, for women with a medium chest and not for women with a larger or smaller chest. The boat neckline or batu. This neckline is also called the batu neckline. It is a wide neckline which almost reaches the shoulder line. It sits very close to the neck, high in the front and in the back. It emphasizes the bust line, so for most people this is a flattering style. But for those who want to play down the bust, do not choose this one. It's a good design to choose with a pear-shaped body and with a small bust. The scoop neckline. This is a deep U neckline, which is wider than the base of the neck. It is suitable to almost all body shapes, face shapes, depending on the depth of the neckline. Most of the body floors can be camouflaged by this neckline. For example, a too wide shoulder can be de-emphasized with this neckline. It can make a short neck look elongated. A collared neckline. A collared neckline can come with a buttoned placket or without. It is suggested for most figures. A strapless neckline can be cut in different ways. It can be cut straight across the body or in a sweetheart neck fashion. This is suggested for women with an hourglass figure. Sweetheart neckline. This is a very appealing neckline with the lower portion of the neckline looking like the top portion of a heart. It is suggested for women with an hourglass figure, suitable for most shapes. Off shoulder neckline. Off shoulder neckline. This neckline is also called a bread dot neckline. A very feminine neckline, which brings attention to the shoulders and neck. For those with slender shoulders, this can look very appealing. Suggested for women with an hourglass or pear-shaped body. A wide square neckline or Florentine neckline. As the name suggests, this is a very wide angular or square neckline. Though modest, it's suggested for most figures. Wow, I never knew necklines plays a big role in the style of the garments. Thank you, miss. We're not done yet. We also have factors that influence fashion changes. What do you think is the cause of changes in fashion? We have social factors, political factors, economic factors, religious and technological factors. Those are a few factors I can remember. Thank you, Devan. Fashion is influenced by many key role players such as style editors and designers. The most important role player is probably the consumer. It does not matter how beautiful or stylish an item is, if no one wants to buy it, it will fail miserably. There are a few factors that could influence the fashion industry and trends. One, social changes. Celebrities are one of the biggest fashion influencers. Fashion designers design outfits for celebrities to wear in movies, fashion shows, red carpet events. These outfits, when seen on celebrities, get attention of the public and become popular. 2. Political changes During World War II, women had to do most of the work, 
which had been considered to be a man's job. This means that women suddenly find themselves fixing cars and working in factories, and offices where heavy dresses and many layers of clothing were unsuitable. 3. Economic changes. The economy of a country is another factor influencing fashion. When there's a rise in the price of a fabric, designers make, make certain alterations to their designs rather than pricing it high. If no one can afford to buy the latest trends, then the fashion industry will collapse. As a country's economy declines, luxuries such as unnecessary clothing items become obsolete. 4. Religious changes. Certain religions have specific rules as to what men and women are allowed to wear. If a designer would like to reach this market, they will have to cater to these rules or no one will buy their clothes. A good example of economic changes is the current situation we're in. Death of COVID-19, so most people lost their jobs and buying clothes is the last thing in their agenda or budget. With politics, when it's time for election, each designer designed clothes for the political party of their choice. That's how I understand those changes. Is that correct, miss? Yes, Tavern. Very correct. And that brought us to the end of our lesson. Before I give the activity, I would love Cecilia to recap on what she learned today. Well, I've learned that fashion so what is the outline of the garment. And classic style, which is the style that does not go out, out of fashion or it lasts longer in fashion. Three, different types of necklines, jewel, v-neck, scoop, collar, just to mention a few. And finally, factors that influence the change in fashion, social changes, economic, political change, and religious change. Thank you so much, Miss. I learned the difference between fashion fed and classic style. Fashion fed is short-lived fashion, meaning that the style does not last longer in fashion, while classic style is the style that lasts longer in fashion. That brings us to the end of today's program. But before we say goodbye, here's your question for the day. Question. Compare fashion fad with classic style. So until next time, take care. This program was brought to you by NAMCOL with funding from the Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture and the Commonwealth of Learning. Hello listeners and welcome to the second program in our series, Let's Learn Fashion and Fabrics, which is produced for JS Grade 9 learners and anybody else who has an interest in the subject. My name is Jandre and today we will learn about the man-made fibers. Please have a pen and notebook ready so that you can make notes on the important points. And don't forget to take part in the quiz at the end of the program. Clothes are made from fabrics. Fabrics are produced from fibers. They are natural fibers and man-made fibers. Therefore, it is important to know the type of fibers that produce the cloth you are wearing. At the end of this program, you should be able to classify the following man-made fibers into groups according to their origin. Non-thermoplastic, 
regenerated, viscose and rayon, thermoplastic, synthetic, nylon, polyester, acrylic. List examples of each fabric manufactured from the fibers mentioned. You know what, Erita? I really hate the shirt I'm wearing today. It creases badly. Well, what did you expect? Your shirt is made from cotton fibers, and you know cotton creases badly. If you don't like ironing, then you must buy clothes that is made from polyester or silk. We're so late for fashion lesson. Miss Shunana is going to scold us. Good morning, class. Can we all take our respective seats? Petrina and Erita, do I always need to remind you every single day that a student has to be punctual at all times? I'm sorry, miss. It won't happen again. I'm sorry too, miss. I was busy ironing my shirt. It creases easily. <laughs> Thank you, guys. You just took us to our lesson for today. We will be discussing the man-made fibers. So, what do you know about man-made fibers? Erita, your hand is up. Do you want to share something with us? Yes, miss. Man-made fibers are originated and manufactured by men. Very good. <clears throat> Man-made fibers are divided into two groups, non-thermoplastic, which are regenerated, and thermoplastic, which are synthetic. Who's going to differentiate between the two man-made fibers I just mentioned? Yes, miss. I'll try. Thermoplastic fibers are softened by the heat. They will melt but will not catch fire or burn rapidly, while non-thermoplastic fibers are not softened by heat. They will catch fire easily and burn rapidly. When ironed with a hot iron, they will scorch or burn easily, but they will not melt. Great, Erita. Let's classify the following man-made fibers into groups according to their origin. Man-made fibers consist of non-thermoplastic fibers, which are regenerated cellulose fibers, such as rayon or viscose, Thermoplastic fibers, either purely synthetic or partly synthetic. Purely synthetic, one, polymide, such as nylon, two, polyester, such as dacron, terylene, or crumpline, or three, acrylic, such as orlon, cortel, or draylon. While partly synthetic consists of acetate, such as salinese, triacetate, such as arnel. From this table, I'm seeing non-thermoplastic fibers. We have regenerated fibers where rayon and viscose is produced. The thermoplastic is divided into two groups. One, purely synthetic, which have three types of fibers. One, polymide, which produces nylon fabric. Two, Polyester, which produce three types of fabrics, uh, which is dacron, tyrolene, crimpline. And three, acrylic, which produce three types of fabrics, which is orlon, cortel, dralon, and two, partly synthetic, which have two types of fibers. One, acetate, which produce solanes, and two, triacetate, which produce arnel. Very good, Erica. Now you know the man-made fibers and fabric produced from them. I've learned the different types of man-made fibers and their origin, as well as fabrics made from those fibers. That's great, Petrina. Well, that brings us to the end of today's program. Take care. This program was brought to you by NAMCOL with funding from the Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture and the Commonwealth of Learning.
listeners and welcome to the third program in our series, Let's Learn Fashion and Fabrics, which is produced for grade 9 JS learners and anybody else who has an interest in the subject. My name is Jandre and today we will learn about sleeves and hems. Please have a pen and notebook ready so that you can make notes of the important points. And don't forget to take part in the quiz at the end of the program. When you are constructing your garments, there are certain parts that need to be well constructed because they will not hang properly if they are not constructed well. Sleeves and hems are some of these. At the end of this program, you should be able to identify different sleeves, set in sleeve, shirt sleeve, puff sleeve, raglan sleeve, kimono sleeve, and you should be able to describe the construction method of a puff sleeve. I really don't know whether I should put on a sleeve on my dress or not. Constructing a sleeve is a bit difficult. I really think you should because your dress will look much better with long sleeves. It's time for fashion lessons. Let's go. Good morning, class. Can we all take our respective seats? Herta and Rosina, put on your mask and sanitize your hands. Okay, ma'am. Noted, miss. Thank you for coming. Today's topic is sleeves. Who's going to define a sleeve for us? Rosina? Do you want to try? Go ahead. I think it's the part of the garment that covers the arm or through which the arm passes or slips. Very good. There are five types of sleeves. Erta, may you list the five types of sleeves? Yes, ma'am. They are set in sleeve, shirt sleeve, puff sleeve, raglan sleeve, and kimono sleeve. Great. Let me explain the sleeves in detail. A set-in sleeve, this is the common sleeve type that is simply inserted into the armhole. A shirt sleeve, this sleeve is a little longer than the armhole on the body to create a bit of volume at the top of the arm. A puff sleeve is a short sleeve that is gathered at the top. It adds volume at the top by gathering fabric at a specific area. A raglan sleeve extends from raglan sleeve. A raglan sleeve extends from the sleeve hemline up to the collar or neckline. A kimono sleeve. This sleeve is cut in one with the bodice in a wide sloping shape. It has a curved underarm seam and a long shaped shoulder seam. According to the objectives, we're supposed to make a puff sleeve. May you please describe to us how to construct a puff sleeve? Okay, Rosina. Let's move to the construction method of a puff sleeve. One, prepare your fabric. You should have enough for the sleeve and one body part where you can fit the sleeve. Two, lay the new sleeve pattern piece on the fabric and cut it out. Three, set the machine for gathering. Four, sew one or two rows of gathering above the fitted line on the sleeve. Five, gather the stitches carefully and even out along the area you want most volume. Six, sew the shoulder and side seams on your body piece so that you have an armhole. Seven, fit the sleeve into the armhole and pin the key points. Eight, make sure your sleeve fits into the armhole and your center points align. Nine, sew around the armhole. 10, trim the frays close to the stitching and either blanket, overcast stitch or neaten with a zigzag stitch. 11, press the edges towards the sleeve. That is the construction of a puff sleeve. That brought us to the end of the lesson. Rosina, can you recap on what you learned today? I've learned the types of sleeves which are satin sleeve, shirt sleeve, raglan sleeve, puff sleeve, and kimono sleeve. That brings us to the end of today's program. But before we say goodbye, here's your question for today. Identify four different types of sleeves. 
that we have learned. So until next time, take care. This program was brought to you by Namcol with funding from the Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture and the Commonwealth of Learning. Listeners, and welcome to the fourth program in our series, Let's Learn Fashion and Fabrics, which is produced for JS Grade 9 learners and anybody else who has an interest in the subject. My name is Jandre, and today we will learn about decorative needlework. Please have a pen and a notebook ready so that you can make notes on the important points. As a fashion designer, you need to design or make something unique to attract customers. Thus, you can add that uniqueness by decorating your garment or product. At the end of this program, you should be able to select the correct embroidery equipment, identify the following stitches, cross, blanket, chain, back, running, stem, fringe, my mind goes blank when it comes to creativity. Ms. Shinona said my garment is too plain. It needs to be unique, but I don't really know what else I should do. Did you try to Google for some ideas? I always research when I need new ideas, then I just manipulate them. Good idea. Let's go for class. Good morning, class. Can we all take our respective seats? Erta, Rosina, put your mask on and please sanitize your hands. Thank you for coming. Today's topic is decorative needlework. What comes to mind when you hear decorative needlework? Rosina, do you want to try? So I'm thinking um, decorating your garment by using needle and threads. Very good, Rosina. Your garment will never be unique unless you add some taste to it. So we have different embroidery stitches we can use to decorate our garments. But before we discuss about the stitches, let's discuss the equipment needed for decorative stitches. Erta? All right, I'll mention them. Needles, hoops and frames, scissors, transferring patterns and threads. That is the equipment or tools that you need to complete the embroidery stitches. Rosina, would you please list the embroidery stitches that you can remember from grade eight? So for embroidery stitches, we have cross, blanket, chain, back, running, stem, French knot, and satin. Very good. Now I'm going to explain each stitch in detail. Blanket stitches. If you have a thick material and you want to reinforce its edges, you will use a blanket stitch. It is purpose developed for the specific action and it was commonly used on blankets, hence the name. Chain stitches. A chain stitch is used when you want to create something that looks like a chain. Therefore, it has links. Methods. First, pull your needle and floss up through the fabric. Then insert it going down right beside where you first came up. Don't pull the floss all the way through the fabric. Allow it to form a loop. Bring the needle up through that loop. This tethers it from being pulled away through the fabric and pull. To make the next chain stitch, place the needle either directly in the hole you just stitched or close to it and pull through to create another loop. Again, don't pull the floss completely through the fabric. 
pull the needle up through the loop to tether it and pull. Running stitches. The running stitch offers a quick way to outline a design. There are two methods you can use. The first is the sewing method. Simply weave the needle and floss through the fabric in one continuous motion to create several stitches at once, as if you were sewing a seam. The second is the punch and poke or stabbing method. Push the needle through the fabric to the back and then poke it through the front a short distance away, creating one stitch at a time. Back stitch. The back stitch is great when you need a solid line, like when you're creating outlines or hand embroidered letters. The method. Begin by pulling the needle and floss up through the fabric and do one stitch forward. From underneath, space the needle out the length of your desired stitch. Pull up through the fabric and bring the needle and floss back down through the end of the previous stitch. Satin stitch or the mask. A satin stitch is known as the mask stitch and it is used to cover a bigger area of fabric. For instance, when you want to cover a part of the tree, you will need to complete it by using back or split stitch. When you're creating hearts or filling in leaves, it's likely you'll want the design to have a smooth appearance. That's where the stitch comes in. It adds a nice raised texture and gets the job done super fast. Method. First draw out the shape you want to fill to use as a guide. With your needle and floss, create one stitch that extends from one end of the shape to the other. Bring the needle up again, just next to the opposite side of the initial stitch. Keep the stitches close to one another, as required to fill the pattern or design you are working with. French knots. This decorative stitch makes a pretty accent design throughout your project. Method. First bring the needle and floss up through the fabric. Then wrap the floss around the needle twice. Hold the end of the floss taut and bring the needle down just next to the space where it came through the fabric. Keep holding the floss taut as you pull the needle through. You can vary the size of your French knots by wrapping the floss around the needle anywhere between one and three times. Stem stitch. This stitch got its name from being used to create flower stems and vines. Method. Start by creating one straight stitch forward, then bring the needle and floss up underneath the fabric. But instead of going through the center of your initial stitch, go just to the side of the stitch through the fabric. Then wrap the floss around the needle twice, hold the end of the floss taut, and bring the needle down just next to the space where it came through the fabric. Keep holding the floss taut as you pull the needle through. Lazy Daisy. A lazy Daisy is created by using a large loop that is then held in place with a small stitch. This form of stitching is used for making flowers, leaves, etc. Method. Your needle and floss and create a stitch. But before you pull the floss all the way through the fabric, allow it to form a loop. Bring the needle up through that loop in order to tether it from being pulled all the way through the fabric. Create a small stitch over the top of the loop, space out the next loop, or use the stitch to create a daisy. Continue as desired. A feather stitch. It is similar to the chain stitch and can be implemented on any of the fabric sides. It looks great and appealing to create it. Method. Start by bringing the needle and floss up through the fabric and creating a straight stitch. Don't pull the floss all the way through. Allow a loop to form and bring the needle up through that loop. Space the next stitch over in the opposite direction from the previous stitch. Create another loop by not allowing the floss to go completely through the fabric. Pull the needle up through the loop and repeat on the opposite side. Erta, can you recap on what you've learned today? Absolutely, Miss. The tools that we need for embroidery stitches are hope and frames, needles and threads, and embroidery stitches. That brings us to the end of today's program. So until next time, take care. 
This program was brought to you by Namcol with funding from the Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture and the Commonwealth of Learning. Hello listeners and welcome to the fifth program in our series, Let's Learn Fashion and Fabrics, which is produced for JS Grade 9 learners and anybody else who has an interest in the subject. My name is Jandre and today we will learn about the utilization of equipment. Please have a pen and notebook ready so that you can make notes on the important points. It is very important for every fashion designer to know the tools and equipment she or he is going to use for the project and the function for each tool. At the end of this program, you should be able to identify sewing apparatus, cutting tools, sewing tools, marking tools, measuring tools, and describe the use of each tool. Rosina, in the list of things that we need to go by, there's cutting tools. What are they? Cutting tools are tools that you use when cutting something like a knife. We're going to ask Ms. Shinana to explain in more detail. All right, let's go. Good morning, class. Can we all take our respective seats? Herta, why aren't you wearing a mask? Um, sorry ma'am, but my mask is torn. I need to fix it. Thank you for coming. Today's topic is utilization of equipment. As a fashion designer, there are certain tools that you need to use in order to complete your project. Can somebody list the sewing apparatus? Herta? Yes ma'am. We have cutting tools, sewing tools, marking tools and measuring tools. Very good. Rosina, would you please tell us an example of a cutting tool? So for cutting tools, we have scissors, dressmaking shears, a thread cutter, and a seam reaper. That's great, Rosina. Okay, let me explain the tools in detail. Cutting tools. A dressmaking shear is used for cutting fabrics. Scissors are used for light cutting, slashing, clipping threads, or for trimming frayed edges. A thread cutter. Pinking shears are used for finishing hem edges and seams because it cuts a zigzag edge. A seam ripper is used for undoing or taking out seams and cutting machine-made buttonholes. Buttonhole scissors used for cutting hand-worked buttonholes. Embroidery scissors used for embroidery and unpicking seams. Measuring tools. A tape measure is used for taking body measurements, drafting patterns and for measuring fabrics. A measuring card is used to measure seams and hems. Adjustable sewing gauge is used for measuring short distances such as the width of a hem, pleats and tucks. A hem guide is used to measure different hem depths for curved and straight hems. A ruler is used to measure and draw straight seam lines and cutting lines. A hem marker is used for marking hems. Marking tools. A tailor's chalk. Tailor's chalk is used for transferring marking 
to dark fabrics. Tracing wheel and dressmaker's carbon paper are used with carbon to transfer markings onto fabric. Sewing tools, needles and sewing thread for basting sewing buttons and mending torn clothes. Pins, used when cutting and sewing to hold the material. A pin cushion, used for holding pins and needles. Straight while working to prevent accidents. A thimble is used to protect the finger from being pricked by the needle when sewing. A pair of tweezers used for removing fluff caused by tailors tacking. A magnet for picking up dropped pins or needles. And a needle threader is used to thread the needle. Wow, thank you so much, miss. I was very confused about cutting tools that were on the shopping list. Now it's clear. That's great. That brought us to the end of our lesson. Rosina, would you recap on what you learned today? I've learned about sewing apparatus such as cutting tools, sewing tools, marking tools and measuring tools. That brings us to the end of today's program. But before we say goodbye, here's your question for today. Question one, list four sewing apparatus. Question two, Describe the use of a tape measure. So until next time, take care. This program was brought to you by NAMCOL with funding from the Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture and the Commonwealth of Learning.